So my name is Nicolas Pallier. Um, uh, this last talk for the morning, I'm going to talk to you about UQ a little bit and Stuxnet as well. So I'm going to try to make it short. Uh, all right. So uh, first of all, I wanted to say that uh, this is uh, a work that was done by Symantec last year by Symantec Security Response. And uh, I was part of this team, uh, but lots of people were involved. So here's the agenda. First of all, we're going to talk a little bit about Stuxnet, just to refresh our memories. And then uh, we'll uh, dive into DoQ and some of the really cool stuff uh, that this malware actually does. And also explore a little bit the connection between Stuxnet and DoQ. So um, Stuxnet, here are the key facts. Uh, again, a uh, small refresher because it dates back to July 2010. So, um, um, it's a very um, complicated Windows worm, Stuxnet. Uh, uses lots of different uh, propagation methods, Se seven of them actually. Uh, four of them uh, rely on zero day exploits, which was uh, sort of uh, uh, an anomaly in the malware world. Uh, also exploit a known vulnerability in the RPC component of Windows, and uh, some of the other uh, exploits that are used leverage CMAN security issues. So um, you also have rootkits that were signed by uh, digital certificates that were most likely stolen uh, from two Taiwan-based companies. And uh, the end goal of Stuxnet is not to just, you know, hop on from Windows machine to Windows machine. The end goal is to find a specific set of machines that have a specific Siemens software suite. and. Uh, the end goal is to infect so-called programmable logic controllers that are basically computers uh, that run factory floors. And uh, bottom line is Stuxnet was the first known or at least publicly known PLC rootkit, PLC virus. Uh, the end goal is uh, cyber sabotage, more specifically uh, the destruction or at least uh, damage of the uh, two uh, uh, things that you see on the uh, left and right of Armadinejad, which are basically a, a cascade of uh, centrifuge in the So um, now on to DoQ. Uh, it basically all happened in October and November last year. So uh, here's the sort of uh, timeline. Uh, it started on October 14th. Uh, this person uh, from Crisis, uh, which is a security lab in Hungary, sent us an email um, uh, basically telling us, oh, we found this piece of malware. It is very complicated. We named it DoQ because X, Y, Z. And we think you might be interested because it looks very much like Stuxnet code-wise and organization-wise as well. So we hopped onto that. And uh, the next five days were sort of crazy. We worked on it uh, sort of to understand what the threat was doing and piggybacked uh, on the crisis paper which was already sort of quite a detailed. And uh, so we, the discovery was announced on the, on the, on the 18th. Um, as expected, a few hours later, the, the CNC that was used by the uh, sample that we analyzed was white. And at the same time was taken down, uh, taken down by the uh, Indian hosting provider at the time. So we still had much to do on the research. So it carried on in the, in the next weeks. And one piece of, um, one big piece, major piece that we're missing at that time was how the DoQ ended up on those uh, infected systems that Boldy actually analyzed. And uh, we got the answer about a week later on the 27th. Um, it turned out to be a um, Word document sent in an email uh, that contained a zero day insight. So talk a little bit more about that later. So, uh, the key facts about UQ, uh, the main fact is that it, the code base uh, for the drivers, for uh, the, the, the external DLLs that loads everything, it's pretty much the same as Stuxnet, uh, but you can see it's been recompiled from source, so you have like lots of small differences in the code, but the, the overall structure and, and, and functionality of the code is very, very similar. The main difference is, uh, lies in the payload itself. Uh, because the payload of uh, DoQ, as far as we saw, uh, is espionage. But you could have more than that. Uh, one of the main differences as well is that DoQ is highly targeted, a handful of corporations, 
whereas Stuxnet was spreading like crazy to reach the uh, intended target. In the case of UQ, it's definitely not that. It's a Trojan. It does not self-replicate. Clarification um, question. Sorry. Would you say it's the same code? Does that mean it had all seven spreading vectors, same stolen certs, or do you mean? So by same code, I mean uh, the, the, the driver that is used to load the threat is the same, and the main DLL, you know, the big DLL that contains a bunch of resources in Stuxnet, this DLL ex has a bunch of exports, uh, numbered exports, so this is the exact same thing as well. But you can see, like, a, you know, small variations. So I'm still not clear because I don't know enough about what the DLL does. Does that mean it had the same spreading vectors or not? S some, some of the components in the DLL are the same, yeah. For instance, the RPC component, which is used to execute things like on the local network, is the same. So, um, so it's not the same code except payload, but it's similar code, except the payload's definitely different. Yeah, but, okay. yeah pretty much. The, the payload basically is part of this main DLL. This huge DLL contains like a bunch of stuff, and the outer layer of the DLL is the same in stuxnet as in UQ. So and it's only and the you're probably going stuff. here anyway. Um, that, you know, one of the things that came up in some of the discussion about Dooku is um, whether it's same authors or it's just same authoring toolkit, whether it was built from the same kit yeah. or whether it really was, you know, sort of handcrafted by the same people. So are you going to be going into that analysis of that? Uh, so our, uh, of course, we don't have, you know, lots of claims to back this up because nobody came out and said, oh, we, we, we did that. Uh, but... Um, Definitely, the people who wrote UQ had access to the source. That's uh, that's pretty much all we can say with certainty. But it could have been a toolkit, or it could have been they're the same. Yeah, but uh, yeah, but if you consider uh, the the potential authors of Stuxnet uh, himself, who would have the sources of Stuxnet? So thanks. Yeah. Um, Yes, yeah, so um, as I was saying, DQ is used to steal information from corporations, so it's not sabotage at all. Uh, the dropper used the zero day, which exploits a uh, vulnerability in the kernel of Windows. And uh, interestingly, one of the driver uh, that is used by DQ to, um, to load the components when Windows boots up is also signed by a stolen digital, digital certificates from a Simlia company, which is also Taiwan-based. Um, there's no self-replication, uh, but uh, DQ has the possibility to form a command and control, um, um, sorry, has the possibility to form a peer-to-peer -peer network to uh, basically pass on the components deeper in a, in a corporate network for those machines who wouldn't necessarily have uh, internet access. So here's a, uh, a partial list of countries that were infected. Uh, in the red, you see the countries that um, we found out, found out based on semantics telemetry. In orange uh, are some countries that were reported by, by other AV vendors. Some of the countries are missing uh, in, in this list, at least one of them. Um, so yeah, mostly in Europe, Southeast Asia. You can see that Iran and Sudan are in the list. Um, the architecture of the threat is, um, again, I, very similar to Stuxnet. Quick uh, question. I, yeah. just, I was just, maybe you mentioned it, I missed it, but how did the, uh, the Hungarians actually gain access to that. So how come Symantec doesn't see it, but you know, a small university lab gets yeah. access to this? So um, uh, NDAs have been signed, so uh, I cannot disclose all the details, but basically the, the crisis lab was working with a, uh, um, a corporation in Hungary, and this corporation happened to be infected by DUQ. That's how they got hands on the sample in the first place. And then because we had done the research on Stuxnet, they sent us the sample. They also sent the sample to a, to a bunch of other AV vendors. You guys, OK. <laughs> um, One other question on the <clears throat> geolocalization. So for Stuxnet, that was pretty sharply Iran. Yeah. And then you know, there was a bunch of others. Is, is it sharp here too, or was it more diffuse? Y yeah, so, uh, so as you can see on this slide, like more countries are infected, but Within each country, only one or maybe two organizations were targeted. And by organizations, I mean like machine, right? So overall, we have maybe like, what, 20, 30 IP addresses that reported uh, being infected by DQ. But that includes Iran. Yeah, yeah. So, so it, it doesn't stand out geographically like it did for no, Stuxnet? No, it doesn't, no. So, um, 
So um, um, just like Stuxnet, the uh, Duke itself is uh, controlled by uh, a, a big configuration data file which has pretty much the same format. A few things change in there. Um, and one of the interesting field is a uh, lifespan field. So it's usually 14 days, I think. Uh, um, so basically those 14 days will uh, instruct uh, Duke to stay on the uh, network, on the targeted network for 14 days, no more than will self-destruct. But the samples we have recovered, the, the lifespan was expanded to 30 days, which probably means that the attackers were uh, nice and cozy there and wanted to get more stuff out. So. Um, the installation process is really convoluted, so if we assume that um, all the uh, targeted organization received the Word document, maybe, maybe there are more, uh, you know, uh, vectors of distribution than just zero day in a Word document, uh, but in the case of the zero day in the Word document, um, the shell code is, uh, it, it all takes place in the kernel because the fonts are processed in the kernel. Uh, and you have a multi-stage loader. Uh, I encourage you to check out our paper if you want more, de mon more details on that. But basically the end goal is to load what you see on the right hand side of the slide, the installation code that bundles three main components of Duku, which is the DLL that I mentioned many times before, uh, the load point driver, and the configuration data file. Um, so the crisis uh, guys seem to, so in just in your installation, in your slide here, uh, mention the reliance on some form of entropy-based tests. Can you say anything about that? Do you know? Mm, I'm not aware of that. Entropy-based what? Uh, so the crisis guy made the mention that there was some, in the code, there was some entropy-based tests that the code was doing, um, but it couldn't give more specifics about what that entropy-based test was. Is that, does it ring a bell to you? No, it, it does not. Okay. It does not. There are many tests in the code. Um, uh, especially for the, the time frame, like both in the driver and in the DLL to make sure that, uh, for instance, if you run the Word document on your machine right now with an unpatched Word, the UQ will not install, like the time frame was like two days. And then the DLL has a different lifespan counter, like 30 days or 14 days. But as far as entropy is concerned, I haven't seen something like that. Uh, so the sign driver, just quick note to say that um, it was revoked as soon as we found it because it was a, uh, a very signed certificate, so easy for Symantec to do any revocation on this, on this side. Um, and this was like the, uh, the, the core of DUQ, the, the command and control module, the, which was completely overkill in the case of this threat. So the whole communication between uh, infected hosts and the, the command and control servers takes place over uh, TCP-80, which is usually HTTP, or TCP-443, which is not necessarily HTTPS. Um, basically, they use like some tricks. The two, D, the two first D words of the stream are used to indicate to the server, to tell the server, okay, this is not HTTPS, it's actually DUQ. And so this, the, the command and control server, for instance, the one in India would reply appropriately and start, you know, DUQ, DUQ communication. So they use a sort of, um, very simple steganography in the, in the in the case of HTTP by uh, prepending blank JPEG files in all communication. Uh, the protocol itself is a TCP-like protocol, um, so they support fragmentation, the sequence numbers, reordering of the packets, removing the duplicates, uh, and all that stuff. Uh, everything is encrypted using AES. Uh, the key is fixed, which implies that the command and control servers that these guys operate have a list of keys uh, for each of the targeted organization, and it makes sense because of the strong correlation, correlation between the orgs and the CNCs. And you also have a, a, a one or two layers of compression, LZO and some custom compression layers. Yeah. So the, um, the protocol you say that's TCP, like that's on top of yeah, HTTP? That's, that's the, yeah, that's the protocol that's tunneled inside Tunneled HTTP. over HTTP, which yeah. is over TCP. Yeah. So there's yeah. two reliable protocols yeah, going on yeah. there. And, and, uh, yeah, and actually you have four of them because HTTP and HTTPS are the ones used when uh, a Duke infected machine communicates externally. But once inside a corporate network, if um, a, a host wants to communicate with another host inside the same network, they, they can do that over the pipes, uh, which, is, which basically removes all this uh, header and the steganography stuff, it just goes away. Or they can do it over uh, HTTPS, but the real HTTPS this time, not, not some fake HTTPS. So overall, you have four methods of communication. Okay, and uh, you mentioned the fixed key, which had me wondering in general about authentication. Are you gonna talk about authentication of command and control and the like? 
what, what do you mean by authentication? So, so if an um, infection receives a command, does it yeah. authenticate it? Like, like look for a public no. key signature? No, or no. does it so, just believe no, no, no. it? Th there's nothing of such. No. Really? No. Yeah. Weird. Okay. Well, if you consider that the, the, the threat is highly targeted, there's, there's not a big need for that. Um, it just I, seems I, that if I, you're I, building such a uh, dicey, provocative malware, you wouldn't want your opponent to take it over. I, I totally <laughs> understand your point. And or to some frame of the, you, somebody, a third party. Yeah. yeah, some of the big botnets out there, for instance, Sality does exactly that. Everything is authenticated using an RSA key, which is embedded in the binary. In that case, it's, I, I understand, because the level of sophistication, they should have done something like that. They could have done it. They didn't go for it. And um, some of the elements, you know, point that, yeah, maybe was not really necessary. Okay. And finally, a point of order. We have five more minutes that we need to stop this. Okay. Session. Yeah, I'm going to speed it up. So, um, the payloads uh, we've seen so far were not super, super, uh, super cool. Um, mainly, it's info steerer components, and that's why uh, that's why we're seeing that UQ does not um, do any sabotage like Stacks and the Boys doing. So, info steerer component to steal like screenshots, keystrokes, files, and so on. They also had a small reconnaissance module that was uploaded automatically when a, when a client was just connecting to the server. And they had this uh, lifespan expansion module. So these are the, are the only three components that we've seen. Uh, they're, they can be saved on disk as well. So we've tried to recover. We've contacted a bunch of our organizations that had been, had been impacted by DQ. And we asked them, OK, maybe you have those uh, specific encrypted files on your disk with this very specific file name. If you have them, please send them to us, because they might be modules that we haven't seen so far, but were unsuccess unsuccessful at these attempts. Um, and so, some of the weird stuff. So I was mentioning that the, the Word document uses a TTF zero day. Uh, it's a one byte override in the kernel, which they managed to exploit successfully. Uh, so some really funny stuff is that the font file claims to be a uh, Dexter regular and the publisher, they use Showtime Inc. And you know that Dexter is this you know, super famous TV show by this, this guy who kills other people. Uh, so, you know, maybe there's um, some irony there, especially that the font file only has a bunch of characters def defined, so you can see only two of them. So, yeah, uh, they, surely they had fun uh, writing this code. Um, this is an inter interesting one, so the link with the, star the STARS virus, which we never really recovered officially. So it happened in April 2011, so six months before Duke broke in the news. Some Iranian officials said that they were hit by a virus. Uh, they did not disclose the sample but they named the virus stars. And um, inside one of the kilogram components of GQ, you have um, a, a, JPEG, a JPEG file that is embedded that prepends basically an executable file, again, some simple steganography. And this, this is the file in question. Um, I have no idea why they, uh, you know, these authors decided to include the picture of a galaxy taken by the Hubble telescope, but that's what they did. And um, you, you may, you maybe one of the maybe that's the reason why the, the Iranian called the, the virus stars. If it's this virus in, indeed, some of the dates coincide in the sense that we have found Duku in a in, I think two organizations in Iran, and uh, it seemed that the timestamps actually matched April 2011 at the time. So it might be the, might, there might be a connection there. And finally, we uh, the, the 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 command and control module. Uh, inside a DQ may have been coded by a different team, by a team that did not code, you know, the outer layer of the, f of the thread because DQ is entirely C++, like Stuxnet is. Uh, the command control module is not. Um, it's like, it's probably C. Um, C with like OOP features, so to have, you know, some of the, fe some of the benefits of OOP without the hassle of the C++. So that's, really weird code. Uh, if you look at the code, you will see it's really strange, especially the, how all the objects communicate with each other, a hassle reverse. Um, they use method calls and queues, event callbacks, very difficult to follow. Um, and it doesn't look like uh, the usual uh, code, C++ or C. Um, lots more of, uh, there are many more oddities in the code as well. I, I encourage you to check the, the blogs and paper if you want to know more. Uh, so I'm just going to conclude fast. Um, 
DoQ, I said it many times, share many similarities with Stuxnet, but the end goal is completely different. Um, in both cases, uh, it seems the resources required to pull such a, such a threat, especially not, not just the threat itself, but the organization and the fact that they target, you know, these corporations and the fact that they have so many CNCs and the fact that these CNCs are just proxies to more proxies to more proxies. It's very extremely professional. Um, it raises many issues, including the attribution issues, which we faced with Stuxnet. We faced them with DuQ as well. Um, but the, you know, the level of sophistication remains singular, so we're probably not going to see that every, every week or every month, not even every year, which is good. Um, and uh, one last thing, the attackers have not gone away. Uh, we have uh, recovered samples of DuQ timestamped as, as late as February 2012. And it all happened in October 2011, so these guys are in no way um, concerned by what the press says, what the AV companies say. They just do their stuff and uh, don't really care. So uh, check out the papers, and uh, thank you for listening. So if you have questions. We have time for uh, one or two questions if people want to ask further. Anything about your last bullet here with the new Dooku binary? Uh, it was just, it was a regular, one of the regular um, binary, nothing major in them, just the compile timestamp changed. That's it. Are, are, is, is that being acquired through the same vector as the original? The, by the researchers? The researchers are getting it the same way they got the original? Or are there new? In the, in the case of this sample? Yeah. I, I don't know. Because uh, I, yeah, I, I don't know in the case of this sample. So can you go back to your installation slide, please? Thanks. So can you, so you said there was a reliance on some kernel module or something else? So, so what is required for the exploit to work? Uh, the only thing that is required is you have a vulnerable version of Word, of course, mm -hmm. and that you uh, open the Word document in the very, very short time frame that is specified in the threat. So I can tell you that for the Word document that we recovered, uh, the time frame was two days, somewhere in July. Wow. So it means like if, yeah, if you open the file, like, you know, you're supposed to open it on Monday, you open it on Wednesday, then nothing will happen. Fine. Great, thank you. Sure. Great, thanks again. Thank you so much.